No, God, please, no! We are in the month of December. There have been a lot of incredible good films that have come out this year. And I was actually quite surprised because we were still in the midst of the pandemic. There are a lot of films that were actually rescheduled and that finally came out this year. This is not gonna be my last video for this year, of course, but this is my second to last video. Here we are, and we're gonna be talking today about my list for the best movies of 2021. Of course, this list is gonna be a mix of subjective and objective things. It's definitely not gonna be aligning itself with your list. It's not gonna be aligning itself with the other lists of other YouTubers that you might follow. And that's because we all come from different backgrounds and we all have different tastes. I will start this video with a small disclaimer and I will be talking about the films that I didn't have the time to watch for this video here and they're not gonna be taken into consideration when it comes to the list itself, of course. First of all, a film that maybe you might not even have heard of it's a pitch upon where's the cool's memoria starring tilda swinton i really really wanted to see this film at the cinema but it was there for barely two weeks and i didn't have to the time to go and see it and i was really 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 disappointed of course i haven't seen the new matrix because it's actually coming out tonight at the same time as this video so i didn't have the time unfortunately to go and see it before i shot this this is all wrong how dare you i'm not gonna be watching peter dinklage cyrano just because I'm not really into those kind of adaptations and it's it's one of those stories that has been told so many different times and I know anyways that I'm not gonna enjoy it so don't worry about it it's, it was never gonna be part of my list same goes with the new Pedro Almodovar film Madres Paralelas and honestly I don't really like Almodovar's films I'm not really interested in the stories that he wants to tell <laughs> He always picks the same actors and actresses who are just giving the same kind of performances and I'm just really bored when I watch his films so I'm just not really excited to see them exactly when they come out, you know? Unfortunately, in this video there will not be the new Guillermo del Toro's film Nightmare Alley but it is a noir film and when it comes to noir films, I have kind of a 50-50 chance of liking it or ha completely hating it. Of course, it must be really hard to hate a Guillermo del Toro's film just because he's so in love with production design. It's almost impossible not to appreciate the amount of work that and passion that he puts in his work. But I didn't get to see it because I don't even know when it's coming out here in France. The other film that will not be in this list, it's Joachim Trier's The Worst Person in the World. I really like his previous films like Thelma, I really enjoy Swedish and Danish and Norwegian films, they kind of have a really weird vibe about them. And of course I haven't seen Paul Thomas Anderson's new film Licorice Pizza. I'm actually not worried that much about it because very often Paul Thomas Anderson films I either find them to be masterpieces or I just don't connect with them at all and I just don't enjoy them at any kind of level. Anyways, I've been talking way too much about the things that are not gonna be part of this list. This is gonna be a long video so let's get back into the list starting from the very bottom of my list at number 20 which is Spider-Man No Way Home, directed by John Watts. Of course you think, why is it so low? It's been receiving so many incredible, good, positive reviews. And it's just because I had a couple of problems with the films itself. Actually, there are so many things that I want to say about this film that I'm just gonna read you my review immediately because otherwise I know that I would just keep talking and talking about it. And we're just at our 20th best film of the year. So we need to rush this, am I right? So let's go. I'm back! I'm back! I will start by saying that I had no idea that this film could turn out this well. I honestly thought that it was gonna be a disaster full of empty action sequences and special effects. But I was surprised to see that the film really slows down when it needs to tell a real story about Peter Parker. I will say it here officially, this is the very first solo Spider-Man movie. This feels like a Spider-Man movie, not really a Tony Stark, is babysitting me or not even like a Nick Fury is babysitting me like we had in Far From Home. You're the spider-ling, crime-fighting spider. You're Spider-Boy? Spider-Man. 
not in that onesie or not. This is a real Spider-Man movie that perfectly encapsulates the idea of with great power comes great responsibility. Of course this is not a masterpiece of a movie, let's be clear. In fact John Watts makes the most bland movie ever when it comes to the cinematography and it really doesn't have a directorial style. In fact the final act of this movie is so dark, muddy and confusing and the more you think about it the more of a letdown it actually was when it comes to the action sequences of course. But like this is like Infinity War and Game Game. It's an almost impossible project to put together in a way that it feels coherent, fun and emotionally resonant. So that's why besides all of the complaints that I might have about this film I think it actually really works and I really want to upload all the effort they put into it. So that's what actually my rating stands for because I gave it a 4.5 out of 5 stars on Letterboxd and I'm still of the opinion that the movie was completely ruined by its marketing campaign which ended up feeling like the most capitalistic toy commercial ever with all your favorite characters smashing together. Dare you point at me. You, you were pointing first. Rude to point. You're being very rude. You're not even- 80% of this movie was spoiled by the trailer and leaked posters and everything else. And it really sucks. I really hope that in a parallel universe there is a different version of Disney who actually held back all the secrets and allowed us to experience for the first time what would have been one of the greatest cinematic experiences for superhero comic book nerds. I mean as it is it still works of course. The cinema was roaring and the audience went insane. It was one of the best experiences at the cinema ever topped only by maybe Infinity War and watching all the Harry Potter movies for the first time. Now if we get into spoilers, I think that this film was a, also a missed opportunity because No Way Home does the opposite that Into the Spider-Verse did. Into the Spider-Verse gave us some wonderful, unique, three-dimensional versions of Spider-Man learning to work with each other thanks to the different skill sets and backgrounds. The Spider-Man in this movie were there but they existed simply as emotional support. They didn't really have any character development at all and they actually ended up feeling quite bland. There's a photo going around uh, on the internet of you and Tobey Maguire on the set of Spider-Man. Uh, yeah, the new Spider-Man movie. Like, they might be doing something, but then ain't none. Like, I ain't, I ain't got a call, so like... I love you guys so much. I mean, don't get me wrong, they gave great emotionally resonant performances, but I do not believe for a single second they didn't have anything else to add to this story that was not part of the movies that we saw in the past. I mean, when I say that this is the opposite of Into the Spider-Verse, I say that because of all the character development was actually given to the villains, who really shine beautifully in this film to the point that I really cared more about them and their doom instead of Spider-Man's. I found it also weird that the Spider-Man didn't seem to be emotionally connected to those villains at all. They were acting all like, oh hi dude who I accidentally killed and who probably gave me some PTSD. How you doing? And I found that that was a really misstep. And all I'm saying with this is that there are almost two different films colliding into one here. There is a darker and more impactful story that Disney didn't dare to address because it was so much easier to just put all the Spider-Man in one room and redo the Spider-Man pointing at each other meme. You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. <laughs> This film has a lot of really good stuff in it. For example, Alfred Molina and Dafoe's performances were scary, good, really, really impressive work. The Scooby-Doo gang stuff actually works really well in this film and Ned and MJ are fantastic supporting characters. Tom Holland gives so many emotions in this film and what a great actor, damn. Also, this is the first film that shows a Spider-Man that makes his own choices and shows his talent. No spider gadgets or anything, finally. I mean, he fucking outsmarts Doctor Strange. So good. This is so good. Also, something that I really liked about this film and that someone else pointed out is that the true origin story of Spider-Man is not simply being bit by a spider, but also losing Uncle Ben and realizing at the most intimate level what actually with great power comes great responsibility means. So this film also managed to do a natural origin story for our pizza without us realizing it. And it's beautiful just because of that. Also, someone who is much more knowledgeable than me when it comes to comics and nerd sync pointed out the fact that across this trilogy, all the villains have always been mad at Tony Stark and not Spider-Man. And this is officially the first Spider-Man MCU film where the villain's goal is actually to get rid of Spider-Man. So that's another reason to appreciate this film. From here on out, watch every move this bitch make. <laughs> 
My next pick is going to be Zola by Yanitza Bravo. This is a completely absurd film talking about how women's bodies are used and objected by other men. It kind of reminds me of the film Tangerine, so the film that was shot with the iPhone, if it was mixed with the kind of black humor of a Coen Brothers films. And it's one of those really perfect films with a very strong visual style. Why are you on my Twitter? Why are you on my Facebook? Why are you on my Tumblr? Why are you DMing me? Sis, why are you tagging me sis. in photos? You don't even fuck with me. Sis. Let me know. Sis. Let me know. Yes, sis. My 18th pick is going to be The Beta Test, which is directed by Jim Cummings and PJ McCabe. I absolutely love Jim Cummings' films. They have such a strong tension and I really love his performances as well. And even though maybe sometimes the stories are quite easy to write and quite predictable, I really love the way that it feels like going through a panic attack for like 120 minutes and there is no way you can stop it until the main character actually calms the fuck down. J'entends toujours les gens dire Oui, euh, il fait grand beau. Ce soir, nous dînerons sous la pergola. Et je me dis, nique sa mère, il nous en faut une. My 17th pick is gonna be a French film and I'm gonna do this one in English just because I want more foreigners, that I want more international audiences to notice this film and that's why I'm gonna be presenting it in in English instead of in French. It is directed by Ludovic and Zoran Bukerma and it takes place really in the countryside of a small town in the middle of nowhere in France. The characters in this film, they feel like people that you might have met while you were traveling in the countryside and you happen to stop by in a really small town to get some bread or something like that. And it really feels genuine and it's something that is really missing when it comes to horror films, which tend to be starring a lot of really privileged, a lot of really predictable kind of sets of characters. This is a coming of age story that is about a man who is slowly becoming a a werewolf and how he deals with that and how he's portrayed as an outsider no one disney in 2021 silencio bruno for fuck's sake we don't talk about bruno, no 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 we don't talk about bruno my next pick is gonna be encanto and this is where my subjectivism comes in really kicking because i had such a good time at the cinema watching this film i was so happy it was one of the best experiences of the entire year this is one of the best musicals that disney has made in a really long time i remember all the songs after leaving the theater and i actually kept singing them for several days afterwards even though it's a really low stick simple story a lot of people have been criticizing that when you compare it to other films like Frozen, when you compare it to other films like Moana. This is just a really tiny film about this community who is living in the middle of nowhere. They want to try and preserve their way of life and there is something or someone that is trying to disturb it. And what, actually when you think about it in this film there is actually no villain because the villain is kind of like the sense of community, the sense of family itself and kind of like the way in which people can really turn on each other very easily as soon as the status quo is broken and as soon as it starts looking like your life might become a lot harder and you're trying to grasp at that final spark of happiness because you want everything to stay the same and you don't want anything to change there's light where you least expect it And my number 15 is gonna be once again another French movie, but I'm gonna do it in English because I want more people to watch it. And actually this director here has been making a lot of hybrid films, either in the States or in France. I fell in love with his directorial style this year and I watched I think three or four of his previous film. And I'm talking of course about Quentin Dupieux and his film Mandibule. Ce soir, j'ai préparé des paupières de dinde. Elle a eu un choc au cerveau après un accident de ski. Depuis ben elle parle comme ça quoi. Bon appétit à tous. Which is really hard to explain what happens in this film. And it's basically these people who are asked to move some specific luggage from one location to the other and they're asked to never open the trunk of the car to actually look at the luggage itself and they have to deliver it to someone else for some money. But of course, 
they actually open up the trunk and they realize that they are transporting a big fucking fly. Wow, c'est une mouche? Mais non. Ah oh, si, putain, c'est une mouche. And when I say a big fucking fly, I mean like a huge fly, like this size. And the three main characters are so incredibly naive in a very heartwarming way. They try and find ways of training this fly to do things for them. They think that this is actually going to bring them a lot of money. It's one of the funniest films I've ever seen in my entire life. And if you like kind of like the Coen Brothers black humor, and if you like absurd comedy, I think you really love Mandibule. My number 14 is going to be John and the Hole, directed by Pasquale Sisto. Do you remember the film We Need to Talk About Kevin? And it's kind of like a coming of age story, but seen almost from a really dark way of how someone could turn out to be a really bad person without realizing that they are just because they don't fully understand like the weight of their actions and they don't really fully understand what they're actually doing and what the consequences are gonna be hi this is anna hi this is anna hi this is anna hi this is anna It's a story about a teenager who finds a giant hole in the back of his garden. So really further away, not really in the back of his garden, you get me? Oh yeah. So many holes, mouth holes, ear holes, butt holes, peach weights. Yeah. I was thinking potholes. Ooh. Let me fill your hole. It's Donald! With heart and thick cement. And he decides to put his entire family in it and to just keep them there and uh, live his own life without his family. It has a lot of weird serial killer vibes. It's one of those really unsettling performances, one of those weird unsettling movies that really lingers in your mind for a really long time. And this makes me realize there are actually a lot of animated things here in my list for this year because it's been a really good year for animation. Come on, louder! Silencio Bruno! Silencio Bruno! Silencio Bruno! Silencio Bruno! Can you still hear him? Nope, just you! Good! Now hang on! Ah, ah, Silencio Bruno! My number 13 is Enrico Casarosa's Luca. Questo film mi è piaciuto un casino soprattutto perché mi ricordava un po' di tutte quelle cose che facevo quando ero, ero piccolo io. Durante tutte le estati, quando avevo tipo 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 anni, andavo giù al sud quindi dai, dai miei nonni per incontrare la mia famiglia e rimanevo là durante tutta l'estate e praticamente era come vivere una vita completamente diversa avevo degli amici diversi avevamo delle attività che erano completamente diverse da quello che facevo quando ero su al nord quando andavo a scuola e quando frequentavo i miei amici e mi sembrava proprio di vivere due vite completamente diverse sono completamente d'accordo che è un punto di vista completamente soggettivo e non oggettivo è un film che è veramente bellissimo i colori la fotografia del film e mi piacciono un sacco anche tutte le diverse teorie che possiamo applicare a questo film qua Don't talk about Bruno. He would see something terrible and then Bruno, Luca, Giulia, The End And now I will move back to English just because I want also foreigners to enjoy this film here and basically something that I really loved about this film is how the queer community has managed to kind of reclaim a lot of things when it comes to the relationship between Bruno and Luca, it kind of like looks like a beautiful film about queer representation, about queer friendships and about discovering yourself and your identity and who you are outside of your family. Go Luca, go! Go Luca, go! I've made an entire video about the film that I'm gonna be talking right now. I'm not gonna be adding anything besides the fact that how the film has grown on me across the different months. So my next film in the list is actually Chloe Zhao's Eternals. You might think that I'm actually insane to put it this high, to put it at number 12 of my list, but to be honest, when I think back on it, there are so many incredible things that this film managed to do, even from a visual perspective, 
that are just stuck in my head and I, I simply cannot forget. And that's one of the main criteria that I use when it comes to compiling this best movies lists. Do I keep going back to this film? Do I keep thinking about it? Do I keep reminding myself of all the different themes of the film itself? And all of those questions I can answer yes when it comes to Eternals. The next film in the list, so my number 11, is gonna be Wes Anderson's French Dispatch. As you know by now, we have kidnapped your son. I know this should be higher in my list, right? And I was thinking of the same, I was thinking of the same, but then I had to do the thing where you actually start comparing films of a director's career, and I actually think there are some other films in Wes Anderson's career which were much more relatable, but also more memorable. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes. In short, the picture was a sensation. And I think The French Dispatch, even though it's a perfect film from like any kind of filmmaking uh, criteria that you could take, I still think that it's not gonna be as memorable as other things that he's attempted in his career, like the stop motion animation film Isle of Dogs, or even the Grand Budapest Hotel, which makes us travel across different European destinations. Michael Myers was the youngest of the Myers children and had since elementary school shown a keen interest in the subject of murder. His hobbies were sharp objects, babysitters, and watercolors. Finally getting into the top 10 of the best movies of 2021. So here we're getting closer to movies that I consider to be almost perfect. My number 10 is gonna be Censor, which is actually a directorial debut by the director Prano Bailey Bond. If you've seen Barbarian Sound Studio, if you've seen David Cronenberg's Videodrome, you will really love this weird retro film that is kind of addressing, of course, what's the backstage of people who were working into the sensor industry and it is really fascinating especially to see them talk in such casual ways of horror films and of horrific kind of things and gory things. It's just a fascinating thing if you are a cinephile, if you are into the craft of filmmaking and of course it starts becoming really trippy towards the final act. This depiction is dangerous. Come on ain't it? I'm cutting it. My number nine is gonna be Malcolm and Mary by Sam Levinson. This film came out at the beginning of the year and I know that when people are compiling best movies lists, they tend to forget about the films and the very good films that came out at the beginning of the year. You are by far the most excruciating, difficult, stubbornly obnoxious woman I've ever met in my entire life. I fucking love you. But I really wanted to put this here because it really just stuck to my mind. Whether it is the black and white cinematography, whether it is the fact that it's actually a bottle episode where it basically takes place just at this house and the people in the story are just walking from one room to the other one and are interacting in different ways. It is a movie about two people quarreling and there are a lot of interesting gender issues when it comes to the fact that very often women tend to make themselves as small as possible if they have a partner who seems to be someone more famous, who seems to be even more appreciated than them by the critics and by the industry. And it has a lot of interesting discussions, but I mostly enjoyed the performances. His music sounded like nothing else. And all of a sudden, it would stop like that, and the audience would be dead silent. The Velvet Underground had hypnotized them. Number eight is gonna be Todd Hines' documentary about the Velvet Underground. I absolutely love the Velvet Underground, but it's not the only reason why I put it this high in the list. It's because they could have made a very traditional looking documentary telling the story of the Velvet Underground and what they were up to back then. But 
without engaging with the visual style and with the kind of experimental tones but this film actually does it when you look at this film every single frame is a painting every single frame is beautiful all the transitions, all the different documentary style interviews, all the different moments where the music starts just fading in and fading out. It's so incredibly beautiful. It is a documentary that is really, really powerful from an emotional standpoint. And it is very rare for me to put documentary in these best movies list because it is really hard to compare real life and to compare fiction. And very often fiction really allows you to tell more interesting and emotionally impactful stories but this documentary did the same for me and that's why it's actually so high in my list Sarah? 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 the next film is by anthony scott burns and it's called the calm true i actually saw this film a couple of days ago this is the most realistic story that i've ever seen about night terrors and about sleep paralysis it is an incredibly creepy film that kind of reminds me of last year's possessor so if you liked possessor this is literally this year's possessor incredible performances of course it is a kind of a simple story but at the end of the day the final act really really works beautiful looking incredible sound design and music by the electric youth if you're a horror fan there is no way that you can avoid watching come true because it is really a cool journey the next one is gonna be once again another animated movie this was such a good year right and it's michael rianda the mitchells versus the machines which is once again i think a netflix original behold cinema This is incredible. This is Into the Spider-Verse incredible levels of good crafting when it comes to the animation style itself. I was so in love with the fact that this of course is about a teenage girl who is trying to enroll into film college and that she's making her short films. There are not that many characters out there like this character here and very often when you depict fans of cinema it is very often a very stereotypical white guy when it comes to films anyways and when it comes to tv series as well and it was so refreshing to see someone that it looks very different that acts very different but that shares that amount of passion that we all do when it comes to filmmaking best five films of 2021 oh yeah oh yeah oh, oh. These are the magnificent films where I had absolutely nothing negative or no critique to have. And we're starting with James Gunn's Suicide Squad. Is this thing a dog? A dog? What kind of dog do you think it is, mate? I'm gonna go with Afghan Hound. Oh my god, is it a werewolf? Yo, they sent me this a werewolf! Yo, let me out! Hey, hey, he's not a werewolf, okay? He's a weasel. He's harmless. I mean, he's not harmless. He's killed 27 children, but you know. <laughs> I had such an incredible time as a comic book fan of the Suicide Squad, as a fan of James Gunn's style, as a fan of action movies, as a fan of horror movies, as a fan of gore, as a fan of like black humor comedies, as a fan of good performances. And? Yes, that is your hand. Very good. We're all gonna die. I hope so. Oh, for fuck's sake. As a fan of good production design, as a fan of good special effects, as a fan of everything that you could imagine, Suicide Squad was an incredible success and I can't wait to own it on Blu-ray or even like a 4K Blu-ray because it had so many cool characters. I'm absolutely in love with King Shark and actually they managed to have a final act with a villain that is interesting that feels different in comparison to all the other marvel films that we usually get Ridley Scott the last duo did you think I was gonna be talking about House of Gucci oh fuck that shit I am risking my life for you you are risking my life so you can save your pride I 
I've read a couple of really annoying things lately. A couple of interviews of Ridley Scott saying that The Last Duel might be one of his last movies at the cinema, meaning that he is having a hard time finding distributors that are interested in putting his films on the big screen which really sucks. The last duel at the cinema was an incredible experience. I really, really, really love when films and directors take the medieval times and they actually try to tell like a honest and real story about it because very often when you we look back at the renaissance when you look back at the medieval age whether it is in england france or italy or whatever it is kind of told through a lens of romanticism that's why i always really enjoyed for example yorgos lamtimos the favorite because i i love when people try to be as honest as possible about these people who even though they were really rich even though they were really important people when it comes to the history books they were probably incredibly stupid or naive or despicable people this film here is incredible because of the script itself i love the way of seeing this violent act committed against a woman of a violent act of rape of course being told through three different lenses and seeing how people basically, they're completely disillusioned. They tell themselves nice stories so that in their own vision, in their own perspective, they are perceived as the good guy. And I remember myself actively cheering for one of those people to win because the stakes were so incredibly high and I was so committed to this story and to making sure that this woman gets her fair share of justice. I feel like this is one of those films that like really resonates with contemporary issues and I really don't understand why no one saw it and why no one is actually talking about it. We're getting into A24 level of pretentious stuff. My number three is gonna be David Lowry, The Green Knight, starring Dev Patel. Once again, another incredible reinterpretation of the Arthurian lore and of the Arthurian legends. Beautiful, incredible. It was just one of those out of body experiences where you think that you know where you're heading, but you really, really don't know. And it really defies your expe expectation, especially if you're a fan of that kind of romanticism when it comes to medieval times. When it comes to my number two pick of the best movies of 2021, it is Denis Villeneuve's Dune. I made an entire video about it, talking about the fact of how much I enjoyed it. And I will link it up here, of course, I don't want to repeat myself. Maybe I want to talk once more about how this movie impacted me a couple of months later. It is one of the most perfect films of 2021. And I didn't put it at number one just because it is part one of two. That is the only reason. And don't take that as a critique, but I can't really say that it is a perfect journey if I still haven't seen the end of the journey. It's kind of like the dichotomy of Infinity War and Endgame. I feel like people appreciate Infinity War a lot more just because Endgame was so good as well. Where the fear is gone, only I will remain. One of the best movies ever made is my number one, which is, drum roll please. Titan, le film de Julia Dugourneau. J'ai déjà parlé de ce film, j'ai déjà une petite critique, donc je vais vous mettre le lien là-haut. Sincèrement, qu'est-ce que j'ai ajouté par rapport à Titan 
C'était une des meilleures expériences au cinéma que j'ai eues de toute l'année. Je suis tellement, tellement heureux que ça a gagné la Palme d'Or au Festival de Cannes. Je ne sais pas pourquoi, mais c'est un film que, qui m'a vraiment, vraiment parlé. Il y a tellement de notions de, et de thématiques intéressantes qui parlent de masculinité toxique, qui parlent des dynamiques entre les hommes et les femmes, qui parlent de euh, les différentes identités par rapport à comment on définit le genre. En tant que cinéphile, en tant que fan de films d'horreur, c'est un film avec énormément de scènes dont je vais jamais oublier and that's why I recommend it honestly if you still haven't seen Titan you should give it a watch because if you enjoyed Raw so her previous film which was presented at the Cannes Festival as well Titan is basically a much better and more mature version of Raw and of all the different themes that she was exploring in that film all packed up perfectly into those hours of filmmaking I will put my list up here with all my different movies ranked from best to least best <laughs> because anyways of course my number 20 will still be a really good film right so I will put it up here in case you want to screenshot it and maybe give a chance to some of them I really hope that you enjoyed this video I really liked the different films that came out this year making this list was incredibly hard because there were so many incredible films this year and there are so many on my to watch lists yet and uh, I might do a chapter two because honestly this list might change but if it does change it's in between different very small nuances of perfection. I still recommend every single one of these films. I think you will have a good time and there is actually a bit of everything. Anyways, I really hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope you're having a good Christmas time with your family. Let me know in the comments if you've seen any of these films here and if you recommend any of them as well. Let me know also what are your favorite film experiences of this year. If it is subjective or objective, I don't care, just let me know. Don't forget to like and subscribe because it always helps. I'm Patrick and this is torn apart! I don't know why I decided to spice things up. Maybe I, I should have said it in a normal way. <laughs> Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. And a happy new year. Stay in your rooms! This is an emergency! This is an insane guest! With a gun!